church. Uh, we're going to send something out tomorrow that I wrote about, like, contrasting tradition with Reformed Church. And it basically is one of these things that I think that we know, but when you look at the contrast between traditional Christianity and what we're teaching right here on all these fundamental topics, there's probably 15 topics or something like that, and it just goes back and forth. It says tradition, they believe this. Reformed Church, we believe this. And I was being generous to the tradition side, too not trying to write it like, you know, in a way where it automatically is discredited, really trying to write it the way that people say it and uh, the way that people actually preach today and writing that and then saying, listen, we believe this. And if you look at these things, they're like entirely opposite. And I think it's a cool thing because Pastor and I were just, Pastor Jose and I were just talking about this too where, you know, it, it's cool to send to somebody too because when people hear terminology, they hear Jesus, they hear Bible, they hear whatever, faith, they hear these topics, and they're like, yeah, yeah I, like, I know, obviously, about that. I've been to church before. But you're like, no. Like, <laughs> you, 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 you hear sometimes what we're teaching and think that you agree fundamentally on what we're saying, but you don't because when you really contrast, like, these two things, if I were to mention some of these, like, tradition uh, little quotes that we put on there, as far as what people traditionally preach, I guarantee you these things, if you said them by themselves, every Christian would agree with you. Like, like you have these, these things where, you know, whether it's about giving or whether it's about living for God or whether it's about, you know, obedience or, or judgment or whatever the topic may be, if you look at the tradition thing by itself, you'd be like, yeah, I think most Christians would agree with that. Now, in an article where you're contrasting these things and you're saying, like, this is wrong, people will probably be like, maybe we'd see your point sometimes, but it's pretty amazing the things the Lord's taught us over the years, and, you know, I think it's a cool thing for us to re-recognize that and just really, like, on, on a fundamental level where we stand doctrally in opposition to what is taught today, but it's good to send somebody else, too, because as I've been saying recently with the whole campaign thing, you know, me, Pastor Zay, Miss Kim, have been talking about the, the campaign um, that we're, you know, doing right now and just getting the word out and stuff. And you know what it really is? The better way to explain it is not, because when I say advertising, it's like, you know, it doesn't, doesn't say it quite right. Like, we are advertising, but the campaign is, you, you see, even with that article, you see the untruth that is typical in the church today. That when, maybe even when we hear certain things like that, but definitely when the church as a whole hears these things, it goes over our head because we think like that's right. We don't think anything of it. And when these things are actually untrue, you know there's a problem in the church today when these things are like a given. They're things that you'd find on the tenets of faith of a church's website. Like th these are things that they're saying are like foundational. As a church, these are the foundational things. And when you see that the foundational things that people believe are mostly incorrect, things that what we teach really opposes, then you realize the need for a campaign right now. It's not a campaign just about Reformed Church. You know, it's, it, that's not what it's about. We're campaigning for the truth. We're campaigning against fortresses, against imaginations, against things that hinder people from coming into the kingdom of God and from entering in the things that Jesus provided them. I mean, you know, uh, Jesus said to, um, let, let, let me show you this, uh, Luke eleven fifty two. he says, Woe unto you lawyers, He's talking about teachers of the law. Uh, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. And what it's saying is, um, you, we, I'm not going to go into the symbolism and all this stuff right now, but you know, like righteousness is the door. Well, knowledge is called the key in the Bible. That's why it says the key of knowledge. So in, essentially, you could be righteous as a believer, right? And if you're righteous, that means you have access. Uh, you have the access. Imagine like in my belly right here is the inheritance. Uh, you have a door right here. And the door is um, essentially, and I was going to drag that over, but I don't have time right now. Um, the, the righteousness is the door to what you have as a believer. It's the access that qualifies you to enter what's yours as a believer. But if you don't have knowledge, it's like having a door and having something within that door and possessing both, but the door is never open to you. And you never enter in because you don't have knowledge. Knowledge is called the key. So um, there's a way to enter your inheritance, which is righteousness that Jesus provided us. 
there's that life on the inside of you that you want to enter. So there's life on the inside of you. You have the way to get there, which is righteousness, the qualification to enter. But it doesn't mean you enter as a believer. Just because you have that life on the inside of you and you have a way to enter it doesn't mean you're going to access it. Most believers don't. Not very much, at least. And the reason is because they're missing knowledge. Knowledge is like a key that allows you, knowledge allows you to utilize your access and utilize the life that you have on the inside of you. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the life, and I'm the truth. I'm saying that in that order for a reason. He's the way to enter our inheritance. He's that life that we want to enter, but he's also the truth. Truth is the key. If you don't know what you have, you don't live in accordance with what you have. You don't walk in the things that you have. Jesus is your truth. He's not just your way and your life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. The life is the inheritance. That's what's on the inside of you. You know what, and, and you know, Ms. Kim, could you, could you help me get this? You know what? I got this as a Christmas present, so we're going to use this because that's why we got it. So I, it can just be up there while I'm talking. So you got you, and the life is on the inside of you right here. This is the life. You've got a door to enter it into your belly. And that door is righteousness. I'll just put an R there. That's righteousness. We, Jesus is the life to us. That means he's, he's that source. He's, he's, he's our inheritance. He's the kingdom of God on the inside of us. And he's also our way to get there, right? He's our qualification. Because if you just had life, if there was life out there, but you weren't qualified to enter it, you wouldn't be able to access it, right? You need to be qualified for it. It's like this. It's like the law talks about blessings, right? But under the law, you, you're not qualified for blessings through the law. There's no access point with, with the law. Jesus came to make us righteous so that we have access into this inheritance. The inheritance has always been there. Jesus has always been life. Jesus has always been the inheritance, but we weren't always qualified for it. So Jesus came, died for our sin to qualify us for that life. But here's the point. Every believer looks like that. Every believer has life. Every believer has the power of God on the inside of them. And every single believer has the qualification. They have the righteousness that enables them to enter that life. But without knowledge, it's like having all this and you don't have a key. You need knowledge up here and you need a key to actually utilize your righteousness. It, then when you have knowledge, what that enables you to do is through righteousness you enter that life. That's why he says here, Woe unto you, lawyers. You've taken away the key of knowledge. And that's, that is, right there, that's what the church looks like. There's nothing up here. They've got life. They've got righteousness. And true, Christ is their truth on the inside of them as well. But because they don't have knowledge of that truth, they don't know what they have. They don't know properly about the righteousness they have, and they don't know about the life that they have. Without knowledge, it's like having a door to a room without a key. It's why you don't see more of the power of God today. It's why people don't experience more of what God has for them today. Because, like it says here, you've taken away the key of knowledge. And it says because they don't have the key of knowledge, what does it say? You have not entered in yourself. You can't enter in. Now, for them, I mean, it wasn't on the inside of them, like a believer. But you haven't entered into the life of God, it says. Um, and them uh, that were entering in, you hindered. You hinder people from entering the kingdom of God. And for a believer... The kingdom of God isn't out here for you to enter. For the believer, the kingdom of God's in here. And the, and the door that you have is in here. For an unbeliever, when they first enter the kingdom of God, it's external to them, right? And it falls upon them. It falls into them. You know, from heaven, falls into them. For a believer, this kingdom that we're entering is on the inside of us. Righteousness is on the inside of us. That's why I draw the picture like that. And without a key, without knowledge, knowledge is that key to enter here. And that's what the church looks like today. Because it says, when you take away the key of knowledge, what does it say you do? You hinder them from entering. You hinder people from entering without knowledge. That's why, you know, when we campaign and when we talk about advertising, it's because we want to put back in the key of knowledge. We want to advertise, not reform church as much as what we're teaching. The reason why this is, this is um, uh, necessary and the reason why what we're doing is so important, the reason why I talk about, like, this passion and almost like an anger over this, like, you know, Every, it just seems like any time the Lord brings something up to me and I'm thinking about the truth and I'm thinking about just something personally, he keeps tying it in recently with the whole campaign because he'll show me something or, you know, I'll just be meditating on something. And these days, 
I just can't think of a truth that the Lord's taught us without thinking there's no reason why these people don't know this. There's no reason why the church doesn't know this as a whole today. So, you know, that's, that's where, like, the, the advertising thing comes in is only because we want to campaign for the truth. We want to break down fortresses in people's minds. We want to break down blockages in people's minds so that they can enter the things that are theirs. That's the whole point. Knowledge is a key that allows you to use your righteousness. Because remember, you have righteousness. It's your access. But knowledge is what allows you to use it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And those three components are not, they're not, um, like, like it's not a mistake that he specifically said those three things. I'll give you another example of the, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus say, said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, right? You got way, truth, and life right there. Kingdom of God, that's the kingdom right here. That life, that's the kingdom of God. He's on the inside of you. He says, seek the kingdom of God and what? And his righteousness. What's righteousness? Righteous, why is that necessary to say kingdom and righteousness? Because it's not just the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God's always been around. Under the law, you weren't qualified by your works to, to enter it. But now, through the righteousness that is a gift through Jesus, he's given you an access now. Now you're qualified to enter. And every believer has that, sitting on the inside of them. But in the church today, we are not entering what's ours. And I believe that this church is ordained to show people the way, show people the way into the inheritance that they have. That's why we're around. This is actually prophesied in the Bible about this church. I'm not making that up. I'm not even going to go into it because I'm not trying to promote this ministry as much as just promoting what we teach. But you can take my word for it. This church is prophesied in the Bible. Okay? And, and, and I don't care if, if you don't accept that, if, you know, accept the, the, my, my preaching right now, not even this particular point if you don't like it. But it's true nonetheless. To show people the way into their inheritance. Because again, just to get back to the seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God wants you to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Because not only do you have the kingdom, but you're qualified to enter it. So you got way and you got life. And what does he tell you to do? Seek it. What's the seeking? Truth. He's telling you to find out. When he says seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, find out about the kingdom and my righteousness. Find out about it. Because it, why? Because if you don't have knowledge of it, you will never use it until Jesus comes back. But the only reason even when Jesus comes back, while you'll actually end up utilizing your life in full and you're, therefore it will glorify your body, is because why? Because knowledge will be present. The key of knowledge will be present in your head. So Jesus comes and says, when Jesus comes back, he comes and puts the key of knowledge in your head, and what happens? Your body gets glorified, the world gets transformed, all of creation is recreated. Why? Because of simple, he put knowledge in your head of what you already had. Knowledge is the key to entering what you have in Christ. That's why it's not just that you have the kingdom and you have his righteousness. God says, I want you to seek it. Seek me. Because it's necessary that you understand these things before you receive from these things. You have the full kingdom of God on the inside of you. You have the answer to every single one of your problems on the inside of you. You have the answer to everybody else's problems as well on the inside of you. And you're qualified to get there. Because by door, all I'm saying with this is just qualified. Right? You don't really have a door on the inside of you. It's, 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 it's sort of metaphorical in that sense. It's not a wooden door, obviously. But all I'm saying is that you got life and righteousness on the inside of you, which means that you have the inheritance and you have the way to get there. You have the, the, the qualification to receive it. And without knowledge, you will walk just like the Gentiles walk. You'll walk like everybody else walks if you don't know what you have and don't know who you are. And, and obviously, the evidence, evidence of our knowledge is our words. Is our words. Don't let anybody fool you into saying, yeah, I know that, because you can tell by their words. The Bible says you'll know them, talking about teachers, by their fruit. The, 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 their fruit there is not talking about their actions, it's talking about their words. When we're saying the things that we say in the church today, you're not going to fool me into thinking that you actually know what I'm saying or that you actually know the truth. The things that people are preaching today are foundationally untrue. Like, it's one thing, right, like when we can kind of agree foundationally on, like, Jesus provided this and salvation, this is what salvation is. We can't even agree on salvation. People believe that the primary thing that Jesus came to save you from is hell. The primary thing Jesus came to save you from is actually the tribulation in the earth. Think about this. This is a foundational point. This is something that everybody should know, and we don't know. So when you have foundational things that we're disagreeing on, 
obviously none of our words are going to be correct, and that's evident from the way that people talk. Again, I could go through all the things. I would encourage you, we're going to send it out tomorrow, about the, the, the comparison with um, um, you know, tradition and, and, and what, we're, what we're teaching here. But even when we send that out, I just obviously I hope everybody understands that I'm not trying to promote Reformed Church just because like, this is the church I go to or something like that or because this is where like, I work and stuff. Um, it, it, it's not a matter of whether you like Reformed Church as a ministry as much as what, are you for what we're teaching, you know? It, it, it's about the truth, and God wants to restore the key of knowledge so that they can actually utilize the righteousness and the life that they have on the inside of them. That's kind of how that all works. And uh, I won't go into this right now, but it's like, you know, instead of the key of knowledge in their head, they got fortresses. They have blockages instead in their head. Like I said, I, I don't have time to kind of go into all that right now, but that's what, when the Bible talks about pulling down fortresses and imaginations and stuff like that. It's basically talking about you can have knowledge in your head or you can have a fortress in your head. You can have a blockage where you can't see. And uh, instead of a key, people got fortresses, things that are blockages in their eye, and they can't see clearly. That's what that means. You ever, I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop with this. Like I said, I, uh, this will be sort of more of a teaser because I, I can't go into this right now. But um, you know the, the, the passage, I don't know exactly where it is, it's in the Gospels, Jesus, um, it, I'm sure it's in several Gospels, where Jesus says, uh, you know, to not look at your brother and say, you know, let me re remove the speck from your eye when you've got a beam in your own eye, right? It's always used. Actually, and what he says is, this is what he says in, in particular. He says, first, remove the beam from your own, eye, your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So it's always used, right? Like, don't judge somebody else when you've got so many problems yourself. That's how that verse is always used. But the context is not judging somebody because, you know, you got problems yourself. The, the thing that he says, what? That when you take the beam out of your own eye, what happens? It says, then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So what does that mean? That means instead of knowledge, because the, the word eye there is not referring to these eyes. It's talking about your eye. It's talking about your mind. So instead of a key, we've got a fortification. We've got a fortification in our mind. Instead of a key, we've got blockages in our eyes where we can't see clearly. Um, a beam is just referring to like a, like a construction beam, essentially. It's talking about a fortification. And someone's got a little speck blocking their sight, and he's saying you can't correct somebody else's mentality if you're blind yourself. It's the blind leading the blind then. So he says, first, remove. This is Reformed Church's mandate, right? It's every church's mandate, but this is something that we're acting on. First, remove that from your own eye. He said, and then you'll see clearly to be able to take whatever is in your brother's eye, you'll be able to see clearly to take that out of your brother's eye. Um, like I said, that's more of a teaser just for now, but um, we want to pull down any blockages in people's eyes and restore the true knowledge of Jesus in people's minds so that they can enter the things that are there. So like I said, this is something that the Bible literally talks about. Um, um, and, and maybe, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I won't go through, through much more of this, but um, that's why the fortress had to be pulled down, you know, before the people entered Canaan. You know, they were already made righteous, and uh, they just had to listen to the truth. And then what happened? The walls came down first, and when the walls came down, they were able to enter their inheritance. And that's that's kind of what's happening, right? Is that it, it depicts what that depicts in the in the um, in that passage? I know I'm not doing it justice right now, but they had the life of God already. They had the stored corn of the land. They had that. On the inside of them, they had already been made righteous. But when you have blockages in your head, there's no knowledge that allows you to use it. And so the walls had to come down first. And when the walls came down, they were able to enter what was theirs. Um, so anyhow, that's kind of the deal. You have taken away the key of knowledge and not entered in yourselves. And those that are entering in, you've hindered. We want people to enter the things that are theirs, right? <laughs>